And welcome, welcome to uh, People Rising. <laughs> Yay. Oh, here we go. We got still got a couple more people showing up here. We'll, uh, th there we go. Uh, okay, so we're going to just go ahead and get started. We got a big show for you today. Oh, man, wait a minute. Ed's supposed to be in the green room. <laughs> Okay, this, <laughs> so Ed's, Ed went back into the green room, folks. He wasn't supposed to be out on the sh on the stage just yet. Uh, okay, and we still have a couple of people uh, coming in. So uh, welcome to uh, our people rising LinkedIn. We still have folks coming in. We will uh, wait. Just If you're out there, please go ahead and say hello to us. And uh, we will get started. Uh, my name is Linwood Ross. I'll be your host today. I'm the founder and CEO of Accelery, right? We help accelerate digital transformation. And uh, I'll have everyone else introduce themselves uh, right now. How about we go ahead and start with Shelly? Well, <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Shelly Jeffco. I am actually coming to you live from the Emory's uh, Gazetta Business School Women's Leadership Conference. So, uh, so I'm really excited to be able to step out and join my fellow cohorts here uh, for another fantastic conversation with one of my superheroes, <laughs> Dr. Morrison. <laughs> and uh, Kim, how about you go next? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Kim Blue. I am um, leading up my own um, HR consulting firm, K Blue Consulting, and very happy to be um, alongside all of these brilliant brains as we enter into our second week of People Rising. So many great people uh, showing up. Go ahead, Peter. Hi, I'm Peter Laughter, and I'm the founder of True Baron, and, uh, and and it's nice to see uh, you all and some friends. Hey, how are you doing, Mari? Um, welcome, and I'm really excited to see you. Karen. Hi, I'm Karen Brieger, and like Claire, who's joining us today, I am in New Hampshire about to get dumped on with some snow. I am a chief people officer that's been in a number of different industries, including software, bank financial services, uh, medical device, manufacturing. I'm actually in transition right now, although also doing a little bit of consulting work on my own in the HR space. And I'm week two. This is so exciting. You know, I, I love the, um, I love, you know, you know, every, a lot of people are in transition, right? A lot of people are doing, you know, so we're just keeping it real here. <laughs> yeah. and I, you know, and I would say to anybody out there that's in transition, connect with me. I'm happy to help and support. You know, we need to be there for each other. That's part of what community and connections are all about. Yeah, it's a great so, point. So yes. great. Love it. Love it. So uh, before I introduce Ed, let me, uh, I don't know if I introduced, Jer I don't know if I showed Jared. Welcome, welcome, Jared. Um, before I introduce uh, Ed, let me share uh, our, our guest for next week. Like we like to do that um, early in the show in case people need to leave. So uh, I'm going to just share my screen. Next week's guest is Aaron Sojourner, okay? Aaron is a labor economist, right? He's a senior researcher with the W.E. Upjohn Up Institute for Employment Research, and uh, he's a former senior economist with the White House Council of Economic Advisors. We're, you know, thrilled to have him. Next week um, in the United States, the labor report comes out, so Aaron will be uh, coming, uh, Aaron will be with us, you know, right after the, well, not right after the labor report comes out in at, um, at 9am, but he will be on the show obviously at one and you should, um, bring your questions for him. I'm sure he'll have some charts because economists like charts, but, <laughs> uh, also, you know, if you have questions about the labor market, Aaron's your guy. Okay. I actually think I was looking at this picture. I think that's the White House behind him, actually. Uh, so anyway, now let me introduce um, our guest. Uh, let me see if I can make this work. Work for me. Work for me. Uh, 
Yeah, if, if, if I work for the White House, I would definitely have my headshot taken with the White House behind me, without a doubt. I think there we go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Who wouldn't, right? Uh, so today's guest is Dr. Ed, can I move that caption? You guys can't. Uh, sorry. Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, today's guest is Dr. Edward Morrison. Um, I have had the privilege of um, talking to Ed, you know, at least once a week now. Well, maybe not once a week, but close to it uh, for almost a year. It has been awesome. Um, it, it would take me 15 or 20 minutes <laughs> to really um, share all that he's accomplished um, in his career. Um, but let me just give you just a couple of highlights, which I think are so important for framing the conversation that we're going to have today. So um, Ed's Ed, uh, Ed's journey actually began in Oklahoma City, okay? And Ed's work has been used to revitalize that city. Um, and it has been really um, a model, uh, potentially, right? A model for the United States. And that's what you see right here in this article, right? Uh, why Oklahoma City could represent the future of America, right? Ed, that's Ed. Ed's behind. Ed's kind of like behind that, so it's it's pretty cool. Um, Ed's worked with Lockheed Martin, helping the uh, United States Navy with uh, incredibly complex collaboration uh, for their Aegis um, Navy fleet. Right, this is the defense systems of the United States. Okay, they accomplished something really remarkable using Ed's work and working with his team. And the best and the brightest in uh, academia, in business, Amy Edmondson, so many people know about her and psychological safety, her book, uh, The Fearless Organization. You know, she has amazing things to say about Ed's work, strategic doing, the 10 skills for agile leadership. Uh, I, I won't say that he needs no introduction because, um, you know. You just gave one. Yeah, I just gave one and he's, it, I could say so much more. So uh, we're just really, uh, I'm just thrilled to uh, be able to call him a mentor and a friend. So here, here's this group working with Ed. I want to throw that picture in there. We've got something big planned for you guys. We've been working on it. That's a picture of us working together to get it done. And so now here's Ed. Well, Lenwood, thank you so much for <laughs> for uh, doing this. This is great. I, I'm I'm just amazed that you're able to. Uh, you know, it reminds me of the organ player. You know, beats going. You know, it's like, <laughs> like how does it, how does all this happen? So, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, the question that we um, asked for you. Uh, and yeah, everyone relax, <laughs> <laughs> relax, relax. Okay. So, uh, the question we asked for you, uh, asked you, Ed, to mm -hmm. help us, you know, to share with everyone and, and to kind of get the conversation started, right. Is, you know, what are the challenges we face, right? Mm -hmm. Um, how do we, um, how do we, you know, deal with, uh, the environment that we lived in? We, mm -hmm. we're living in so uh with that you know ed are you <laughs> well yeah so let me answer that in two ways uh, you know obviously the external environment that most companies are dealing most organizations are dealing with is is becoming more uh volatile or more uh uh more disrupted are the terms that a lot of people use uh, of course, that's happening. We're all operating in the complexity world. We're all operating on dancing landscapes. In other words, the landscape keeps moving around. Uh, so it's not too dissimilar to, uh, you know, trying to navigate. If you've ever done any ocean kayaking or anything like that, and, you know, it's a whitewater world, as, as John Seeley Brown talks about it. So externally, there's a lot more happening. Um, but internally, there's a lot of challenges too because each one of our organizations is a, if we think of it as a living system 
has to learn and adapt. And the problem is that the routines, the legacy routines that we have in our organizations, uh, frustrate learning, frustrate learning. And so this is a big problem because if you frustrate learning, then you don't learn and adapt. And of course, as you hit the top of an S-curve, everything is a learning system. If you hit the top of the S-curve and you're not ready to jump to a new S-curve, whether it's a business unit or the organization itself, um, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. So um, our work is really focused on how do we uh, deal with these complex problems, increasingly complex problems, both internally and externally. And the answer is uh, we have to go back to our oldest technology. And what is that? Well, it's, it's how we connect. It's our conversation. Because we're not very skilled at how we design and manage our conversation. And so this is what we're doing in our work is teaching people the skills, the interconnected skills of having collaborative conversations. Uh, and that's that's really what we need to do because we're we're we've got these legacy systems, we've got these legacy mindsets, and increasing the world is the boundaries are porous, the world is more horizontal, more connected, and it's uh, more volatile. The dancing landscape is dancing. Yeah, Ed, when you talk about S curves, can you ex just talk about that a little bit more and explain what you mean by an S curve? <clears throat> sure. Um, when I was developing strategic doing in the 2000, 2005 timeframe, I was at Case Western Reserve University and a mentor of mine just sort of showed up on my doorstep. And this guy's name was David Morgenthaler. And you can kind of look at him up, but he's, he's dead now. But he was the founder of Morgenthaler Ventures, which was one of the first venture capital firms. Oh. And so he sat through one of my presentations and he said, you know, you need to use S curves to understand this volatility. And I said, well, why is that? He says, because everybody understands that. We, we personally go through S-curves, right? So it's a, it's, it's a way of describing growth, the growth cycle of any living system. And of course, there's an early stage uh, formation. There's a growth phase. There's a maturity phase. And of course, a decline or death phase. And if, uh, if you think of businesses as, uh, or organizations as um, uh, on the nest curve, you can start to see when it is that you need to be moving to a new S curve, and and actually it's more a bit more complex than that because if you're in a big organization, you have business units that are all along the S curve. You have some people that are just starting out with new ideas. You have some people who are trying to figure out what the new system is, what the business model is. So you have business model innovation happening. You have scaling and quality questions that are happening as you scale. And then, of course, when you are figuring out this is uh, this uh, business or this organization, this part of our organization no longer fits in our per portfolio, you've got to figure out how to reconfigure that portion of your business. Are you going to sell it? Are you going to merge it? What are you going to do with that? How you re how do you redeploy the assets that are that are there? So there's questions all along the S curve that every organization has to deal with, and these are fundamentally adaptive questions different from technical questions. A technical question, which is most what man managers deal with a, a lot, are problems with an answer. These are problems with an answer. But managing a growth curve, managing an S curve in an, inside a business is an adaptive problem. It's an adaptive to the environment in which you're operating. It's adaptive to the maturity level of your business. And these are, these are, there's no manual that you can go to and say, okay, well, this is the answer to that. And so you have to generate solutions to these adaptive problems. And the solutions themselves require collaboration across business units, you know. And so um, hierarchies were designed for very stable businesses to maximize efficiency. But hierarchies are not really great at adaptation or learning. And so this is why, as we move into a more volatile environment, a more interconnected environment, uh, we have to uh, move toward more learning organizations. And we, we've known this for a long time. I mean, the idea of a learning organization, probably, I don't know, Sengi was 1990 or something like that. But we've been miserable at uh, deploying these organizations or you know, designing and guiding them. 
And I argue that the reason is, is we're, we've neglected the core technology, which is our conversation. That's right. the core technology. And we are pretty bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> I think anybody working in an organization. <laughs> well, just, another way to look at it is there's a lot of room for improvement, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's, and that's so, awesome. Yeah, so our work in strategic doing is all around these adaptive problems, the idea that we have these problems we've never confronted before, and in order to generate solutions, so that there's no one solution to them. To generate solutions and to test those solutions, we need to collaborate. And what we've learned in my work is that collaborations emerge from conversations with a very predictable structure to them. So if you know that structure and you can familiar with the skills, you can design and guide the conversations much more quickly. And the payoff is higher volume and velocity of collaboration. In other words, you're learning faster. You're learning and adapting faster. And the good news is that it's cheap to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's people who would pay me not to talk, but, um, <laughs> but, um, but Ed, it's interesting because you, you talked about like learning accelerating but also won't you get things done faster? Won't you be able to do oh. more? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the beauty of it. As you move toward a more loose hierarchy, in other words, you're, you're thinking more about networks than just, okay, uh, the hierarchical structure, the stable structure you're in, but you're looking at connections with suppliers, you're connecting with customers, or you're connecting cross-functionally in your organization, you're building trusted networks and as you do that, you not only learn faster, but you spot opportunities faster, you align your assets faster, you experiment faster, you generate more knowledge faster. And the good news is you're use, using a technology that is cheap. I mean, it doesn't cost you to have a conversation. I mean, I used to say, look, it's costing us a cup of coffee. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's great. Well, Ed, you mentioned that that uh, hierarchies are for stable organizations, and if we look at the results of hierarchies you know, over the last twenty years, strategic uh, yeah, implementation, you know, a anything you know, related to large merger integration, uh, digital transformation, the like, has had a failure rate for the last seventy years, uh, mm -hmm. seventy percent for the last twenty years. And yeah, you know, so I, I wonder, have we ever had stable inst institutions? And particularly as we are going into a phase of rapid change, yeah, you know, is the time of hierarchy over? Well, I, I think you need to, I don't think we can be categorical about it because there are some functions within an organization that you want hierarchical organization to work. In other words, there are some stable functions within the organization that hierarchy does work and efficiency does is important. And you can always improve them with lean processes and the like. But, you know, you want somebody accountable for filing the taxes on time and all that kind of stuff. But increasingly, the organization's activities are not, they're not all organized the same way. They're not engaging in the same way. So some of them have to be much more uh, focused externally across the boundary of the organization, talking to suppliers, talking. Now, let me give you an example. If uh, working with a large chemical company does pharmaceutical chemicals, one of the problems that they were confronting was, was equipment reliability. You know, big pieces of equipment were actually literally blowing up, right? And so the challenge then becomes, okay, well, what do we do about this? If, it, if they try to go to a rule book and have rule book based maintenance, it isn't working because stuff's blown up. So, you know, you can't do a time-based maintenance system. So they quite said, okay, well, how do we move toward sensors? How do we move toward a, you know, a more a digital approach? Well, as soon as you start to change the flow of information in an organization, you open up new opportunities for collaboration. That's the big shift. It changes the power structure and the, and the structure of the organization as you change the information flows through it. So part of the problem I think we've had all along is that hierarchies are very good, but for a relatively and a limited number of um, functions. And I'm not saying go all the way out in a continuum toward uh, open networks, although you can, as we do, operate with innovating networks and we can show you how to manage them. 
most organizations need to move toward a more loose hierarchical frame. This is not a new idea. Thomas Malone came up with this in 2004 on his, in his book, The Future of Work. But again, he didn't, he's an academic and he didn't share with us, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you move toward a loose hierarchy? How does that actually happen? And the answer is you have to innovate. You have to innovate. And so um, you have to have collaborations. You have to have collaborations and conversations that lead to experimentation to figure out what's gonna work because you don't have a rule book to figure that out. And we've been pretty bad at that. That's, that's, what I'm, that's the gap that strategic doing fills is that we're teaching people all over the organization, how do you collaborate? How do you generate solutions, shared value um, uh, with the assets that you already have? Not you know hoping that somebody dumps a pile of money on you, but with the assets you already have, how do you innovate and adapt? How do you learn? And the answer is you apply a protocol or a discipline of simple rules. That's uh, awesome. Awesome, Ed. I like how you, you know, one of the ways that you described it to me is like an operating system, right? Could you like elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, again, if you start to say, okay, we're moving the operating system in a, in a hierarchy, and we've all been experienced that, we've all been in there, is what? A command and control system, a reporting rigidity, you know, uh, that is, is uh, in a sense, ritualized within each company. You know, they, each company has its own, you know, universities have this, you know, uh, reporting relationships. Increasingly now, we have to move toward um, uh, more of a network-based structure. But in order to do that across different types of organizations, we need a common language. We need a common uh, mindset, visual frame. And this is what we call an operating system. We need a process by which we come together and figure out what's going to work, test hypotheses, figure out what's going to work, generate data, and share the data. Transparency, accountability matter a lot. So what Strategic Doing does is provide an operating system. And that's how we thought about it when I came to Purdue. I said, look, this, this thing could work. It's worked for me in my consulting practice. If I can learn how to teach it to people, then it can scale. And we can think of it as an operating sy system. Think of it as a Linux. Think of it as a process by a protocol you follow to connect people together so that they can innovate. It's a process of recombinant innovation, taking all of the assets that we have and combining them in a new and different way to generate better outcomes for what we're trying to do. And um, as I've suggested that when we do that, the productivity of our organizations, the productivity of our existing assets doesn't go up 5% or 10%. What we saw, what we've seen is uh, productivity hits of 2X, 3X improvements. And so, you're using you're, these old assets are locked into old systems that are increasingly less productive. So how do you take those systems, recombine them and generate better results? And you have to have a process of collaboration, which is a process of recombinant innovation. Um, and so if you don't have a process, you know, you're not going to get very far. And so uh, what we provided is a process of an operating system for enable you, to enable you to do that. And uh, the good news is all you have to, it's like a set of skills you learn. We, you know, there's many courses now that are available and you just learn them or read the book or, you know, practice. It's, I still practice these rules all the time. Um, so, yeah, I, that's what I mean by an operating system. In other words, everybody's, talking the same way. So when you go into a strategic doing workshop, we we stripped away all the language of strategy that doesn't mean anything. There's no vision, there's no mission, there's none of that stuff. It's really focused on performance. It's focused on outcomes with measurable characteristics. It's focused on Pathfinder projects with guideposts. It's focused on, focused on what we call the 30-30, which is a uh, um, a, uh, a regular meeting every 30 days to say, what did we learn in the last 30 days? What do we do in the next 30 days? So you're constantly making adjustments to your strategy and you're doing it with 30 minute meetings. Now, I mean, <laughs> it's not, it's a discipline. It's not hard. It's, it's um, you know, it's simple rules. Uh, to, it's not hard to understand it. 
it is hard to implement it because it takes practice. It takes practice. You, you're not going to learn it in a workshop. You're going to practice it and you're going to apply it and you're going to use it. And that's when we see real change happening. And I was, no, go, go ahead, Karen. I, I was just going to ask, so you, you mentioned the 30-30, mm -hmm. right? The the 30-minute meeting every 30 days. Isn't 30 days a long time, though, when you're trying to implement, when you're trying to change? Sure. You know, if I think about the software methodology, the agile methodology mm -hmm. with sprints and yeah. they move much faster. Um, it just seems like that's a long period it, it, of time. It depends on the context. So we we, we just start with 30-30. We say, okay, every 30 days come together and do this. Uh, figure out what you learned the last 30 days. Do something. But people who apply strategic doing do seven sevens. Uh, you know, down in Ecuador, when they were responding to the crisis in Ecuador, we deployed it in Ecuador. And down in Ecuador, the supply chain folks were meeting not every 30 days or every seven days, they were meeting every six hours. And so why? Because they had the pandemic, they had civil di disorder, they had the, the supply chain, people were trying to fill gaps, they were trying to share information, and they had a meeting at seven in the morning, one o'clock in the afternoon, and about 10 o'clock at night. Okay, great, whatever, whatever works. It's a set of principles. It's a set of principles. And it's kind of like Lego blocks that you can, once you learn the principles, you can snap them together, create your own strategy process that's suitable for your own organization. It's not, it's not rigid in that way. Well, and I think that's interesting that you just said that because I think a lot of times when people hear process, mm -hmm. right, we talk about this being a process, I think people in their heads automatically put a rigidity to oh. it, right? But the key to making it work is to have a flexible process, as you just pointed yeah, out. Yeah, you have to have a process that's been validated, okay? I mean, a lot of people have probably, right. you know, yeah, in a process that you can manage, that you can design, that you can, you know, a framework that you can adjust to the circumstances that you're in. And that's why um, we have three levels of training for strategic doing. We have a practitioner training, which takes our book and just sort of says, here's the skills. How good are you at all these skills? Because nobody's equally good at all these skills. So if you've got a complex challenge, you want to have cognitive diversity. You want to have people who are good at some of the skills and some people are good at the other set of skills. Don't have everybody who's really good at just a handful of skills. Entrepreneurs make this all up mistake all the time so there's a practitioner training then there's a certification where where you're trying to apply this and you want to learn how to do this in team-based settings there are rules about how to guidelines about how to set up workshops and run workshops um you know so you take it from the individual level to the team level uh, and then there's a fellowship people can become fellows of this where they learn why does this work why does this work? And they learn the underlying um, research that supports it and understand, because if you want a deeper understanding of why this works, you need to get to that level of understanding. And people can take their strategic doing journey however far they want to take it. We have people, you know, going all the way to the fellows level. We have people just learning it. Or you can listen to a podcast and start experimenting. I don't care. <laughs> get better at it if you you know, if you, you know, just like anything else, if you want to learn it better, you probably should learn it from somebody who's done this. I mean, you know, <laughs> you, know but you can do it yourself. I mean, you know, it's open source in a sense that way, but you're going to learn it better. You're not going to make stupid mistakes if you have people around you who, who've already made those stupid mistakes and tell you don't do that because that's a stupid mistake. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I want to remind the audience, hey, you guys can ask your questions. We will definitely uh share your questions so please definitely ask ask your question i have a question <laughs> i have a question so yeah. okay i think i think what i appreciate um the most when we're as we're talking about collaboration is typically when we talk about collaboration uh people align that with brainstorming <laughs> trying to come up with just a flurry of ideas where this is more systematic and aligned to a process if I am a person on this call and maybe I'm in a very small team in HR, one to two, one to three people, what mm. would you recommend for those individuals or even those uh, HR leaders who have a, a smaller team? How, do, how would they be able to leverage strategic doing into some of those areas? Yeah, well, most, most of the transformations, interestingly, most of the transformations I've ever been involved with just start with a small team. So in Oklahoma City was six people, 
in the water cluster up in Milwaukee it was probably six people and it, it, things start with small teams. So one of the lessons that we've learned is you start small, just start small, start with people you want to know. And in collaboration, we define collaboration though, very specifically, it's not cooperation, it's not networking, it's not all these, it's not even teamwork, okay? What a collaboration is, is a process among equals, of equal, you know, so forget positional power, forget all of that. It's, we're all human here, folks. Process among equals, sharing assets to come up with solutions that we don't know yet. So, so it's, an e, it's a process of recombinant innovation, recombinant innovation. So it's, it's rigorously defined in strategic doing. So it, this is one of the things that drives me nuts. I mean, people talk about collaboration. They really don't know what it is. <laughs> you know, it's like networking. No, it's not. <laughs> so anyway, so that's to start with a one or two team. One of the things that we've seen is that people will buy the book and start reading the book in a group. They read the book in a group. Okay, great. That's a good way to do it. Understand that you have the power to change the direction of the conversation simply by asking a question. So one of the transformative uh, rules in strategic doing is if you're trying to find um, a solution to an adaptive problem, one that you don't know the reason, to, you have to figure out and move toward an opportunity. Don't tell me about the problem. In Flint, if you talk about what's the problem of teenage homicides, well, I mean, all you're going to do is trigger a conversation about, well, the problem is the guns, the problem is the schools, the problem is the parents, the problem is blah, 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 blah. You get all these arguments. But if you start the conversation, well, imagine every kid walking home and feeling safe in Flint. What would that look like? How could we move toward that future? Right. That's what I mean by having an opportunity conversation. And you can take a lot of problem-centric conversations are really opportunity opportunities. <laughs> and so you can, you can frame a question, appreciative question. And that's the second, second uh, rule of strategic doing, which is if you want to move toward an opportunity, frame the question around an opportunity, frame it around a challenge, frame it around some, where you want to go. Don't look in the rear view mirror and try to figure out a solution to this problem. All right, there is no root cause solution to teenage violence in Flint. There isn't one. If we would, if we're smart enough, if there was one, we would have done it by now. There isn't one. Okay, forget them. Don't talk about that. Talk about how you could recombine the assets that you already have in this neighborhood to create a safer environment for our kids. What would the schools be doing? What would the churches be doing? What would the parents be doing? What, we could, what could we do if we all work together to do that, toward that outcome that we'd like to see? And that's the conversation that anybody can have. And so what strategic doing teaches us is that leadership can come from anywhere in the organization. It's not positional anymore. Come Thank you for saying that, Ed. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah, absolutely. I mean, That's my hot I, button. <laughs> when I, when I started talking to Ed about this, um, you know, I read the book and I, you know, went to Ed and said, you know, Ed, what do you think about, you know, using strategic doing to accomplish organizational transformation? And then he began to explain to me how you might do that. And you know, one of the things that I found so compelling about it is this idea of not focusing on problems. Because how often are we, you know, in a conversation internally in our organizations when, you know, we're, we go nowhere because, you know, it's this guy's problem, it's finances fault, it's, you know, if human resources had done this, if, you know, <laughs> And and what happens is nothing gets done. Nothing right, because everybody's done. Everybody's, everyone's like, everybody's looking for the root cause. Where's the yeah. root cause? <laughs> yeah. And and then the projects start piling up all across the organization. People are afraid to move. They're afraid to take action. They're afraid to share things because they don't want to get blamed. Right. They don't want to get blamed. So we've got to move away from that. Well, what happens is that it freezes the entire organization, right? So you, you're, you're frozen in time while we have this dancing landscape, right? 
And so you're becoming, your organization's becoming less adaptive, less adaptive. And this less is relevant, <laughs> less relevant, less adaptive, whatever. But this is one of the reasons, of course, that, that companies, I mean, one of the perfect examples of this, I used to work for General Electric as a consultant, right? And you could see the problems of General Electric in 1983 when, when um, uh, Welch said, okay, we're going to just focus on these simple rules. And they were the wrong simple rules. We want to be one, two, or three in the, in the uh, business. These are the metrics we're measuring you on. Well, what, it, what happened was everybody was focused on the goal and they stopped learning. They started gaming the system, right? They started gaming their, their metrics and the organization missed the opportunity of the internet. <laughs> I mean, it's like, okay, <laughs> That's a big so miss. Went, went, went right by them. It's like, okay, <laughs> well now what's happened? The, you know, this story organization effectively has been broken up because uh, I'm sorry, the Welch's, and there are a lot of Welch fans out there, I got it, but in my experience, in the trench, in 84 and 85, you could see the gaming starting to happen, and get everybody gaming the system, and when you're gaming the system, you're playing an internal political game, you're trying to play an internal political game, and you're not learning, you're not learning, you're not adapting, you're not building collaborations, you're not trusting. You're not doing any of the things that we need. You're not doing any double loop learning where are we doing the right thing? No, because, you know, you're just trying to hit your numbers, right? Well, life, unfortunately, is not that um, simple. And unfortunately, what happened at General Electric, which, again, the writing was on the wall a long time ago, uh, was that gaming the system, eventually you're going to collapse. And that's really what happened. And could that be happening? And we have a question um, that I that I want to um, get to. I'll ask my question later because um, I want to I want to make sure that we get um, questions from the audience. Um, this uh, we, unfortunately we can't see who the LinkedIn user who's asking this question. Please connect with me later and let me know who you are. But how best can we embed EDIB, which I think is equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, mm -hmm. and sustainability into an organizational development, uh, an organizational department workflow? and simple ways to build metrics to monitor and adapt changes as it develops. Okay, so the, so you start with the principle that people move in the direction of their conversations. So if you want to embed uh, more equity and inclusion or more sustainability in the organization, start imagining what it is that you'd like to see. What's the future you'd like to build? What is, what is that future? and define it in precise enough ways that you can measure it. So this is the difference between going after a goal, which is what I've been talking about with, and going out with an outcome with measurable characteristics, something you can measure. Because again, we'd like to see an organization that is more open, more equitable, more um, uh, sustainable. Uh, okay, what does that actually mean? These are just words. In your organization, what does that mean? What's the experience you'd like to create for that? And let's define that in clear enough terms that we agree to that. That's part of strategic doing. Where are we going? What's the future we want to have? Give us an outcome with measurable characteristics. Then what you need to do is start moving toward that outcome. You can't just talk about it. You've got to do things because as you engage the system, as you engage what's happening, in your current and move toward that you're generating knowledge about what's going to work you're finding leverage points you're finding you're finding blockages you're finding things that you have to move around but you don't do that until you do something so in my in my consulting practice i would say to people i don't really care what you do i do care that you do something because you're not going to learn unless you do something you learn by doing that's how you do this and so part of this is I, in, in communities and in organizations I, and, and in you know places like Ecuador, I say, all right, imagine the Ecuadorian economy that you want to hand to your children and your grandchildren. What is that? Tell me what that is. Explain it to me. Because if you want to hand it to your kids, you got to start now. You got to build this now. And I talk from experience because I started Oklahoma City in 1993, right? By 2010, people are going, this is a national model. Well, guess what? That's almost 20 years. 
you know, I mean, I worked on oh, strategic doing in Oklahoma City for seven years. So these systems don't change overnight. They don't, you know, they don't change overnight. It, a new leader coming in and saying, we're going this way. Well, OK, great. But it's not going to change the whole culture of the organization. But the good news is that as by focusing on small wins and learning and as you do this definition of what's a small win starts to grow. This is what happens in a network, right? And so how does that happen? Well, there's learning effects, there's network effects. Um, there's what I, uh, some psychologists call positive deviance effect, which is, you know, person's out there doing some crazy stuff and it's working and people go, well, I didn't realize we could do crazy stuff and would work. Well, that's a positive deviant. Um, okay. I, I'm so that. glad that you've given me that title, Ed. I, I've been looking for one. I haven't known what to <laughs> You're call You're the myself, positive deviant. That, yeah, there we go. That's, that's, yeah. I mean, well, I, yeah. in, a, in a sense, that's what I was, right? Because <laughs> when I went into an economics department, you know, they looked at me and said, well, you're a lawyer or, you know, with an MBA, you're not an economist. Yeah, this is, has nothing to do with it, economics. And so, you know, it was 10 years later when I got a Ph.D. in economics. And I guess I'm sorry to say, yeah, it does have a lot to do with economics. It has a lot to do with how we work together and how we generate value. Right. But it has nothing, very little to do with neoclassical economics. So what? I was very much of a positive deviant. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned, Ed, which I think is so powerful, so compelling, is that there are assets all across the organization that are currently being underutilized because we're like, it's like this narrow tunnel vision, right? Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. only these people can do this and only these people can do that. But when we start to have conversations in a disciplined way, then and trust builds, assets are revealed, right? Let's talk a right. little bit. About, and I'm going to share this. Ed, you got a you got a big fan up, Emmanuel. I mean, I'm a fan, but he's such a fan that we can't actually display everything <laughs> we have to say. <laughs> he's he's gone well, past great. the technology. Thank you, thank but, you. Yeah, yeah just but, share. Uh, you know, again, we're try, that my dream is that we. That was why I came to Purdue. If I could learn this and how to teach it, then I could share it and. We could do a lot of cool stuff uh, with it. And, and uh, that's that's what I'm really excited about, because uh, people are learning uh, that the world has shifted, of course, um, that everybody has. We're human beings. Everybody has assets to share. Everybody has gifts and assets to share. And if we can create the environment, that experience where we're all talking to each other, not you know, in terms of our hierarchy position, but as, as human beings trying to solve problems that we have to address. It actually, what the reason strategic doing is spreading is because people have fun doing it. They, they walk away going, this was cool. This, we don't have a marketing budget, but we're, you know, <laughs> we're teaching strategic doing all over the world now. Why is that? It's because people start to realize, oh, it's all about assets within our networks. So the first thing I would do is say, okay, let's go back to the question of we've only got two people and, you know, how to, where do we start? Well, it's not the two people, it's the networks of the two people, okay? So each person has a network of people, experiences, skills, whatever. And you can measure that by, I don't know, 50, 100. You can probably just go down. I, I don't know where I would stop. Okay, it's not two people, it's the networks of the two people that you're trying to, so what? You've got a hundred different assets. If each person has 50 assets, you got a hundred different assets. So, okay, let's go, let's go. You don't need permission from anybody, just do it. And that's what I'm trying to encourage for the next leaders, next group of leaders, because the I'm in the, in the uh, generation of the people who kind of clawed their way to the top. And I tell you, they don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> they don't want to give it up because why? They're, they don't want to give it up. I got that. They, you know, it's comfortable up there. <laughs> they got their memberships. They got, you know, they got whatever. They're comfortable. Uh, they benefit from the skewed way we've looked at our economy. You know, it's, hey, it's all about the market. Well, guess what? The market generates tremendous damage if we don't, if we don't guide it. With, and, with a civic conversation, yeah. 
And waste. Yeah. And waste. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. environmental waste, uh, income inequality. The market not, doesn't solve any of m- monopoly power. The market doesn't solve any of those problems. Markets fail when the civic economy, when the civic economy that surrounds it, and by that I mean our government, our universities, all of our everything that we think of as is for the common good. When that civic economy becomes extractive, people start sucking things out of it, then the markets fail. And this is a study of a wonderful book called Why, Why Nations Fail. Two economists, one from Harvard, one from MIT, extensive idea. And so what we need to do is we need to, hey, we're all in this together, folks. We need to build an economy that's fairer. If we want to sustain democracy, we need to build an economy that's fairer. We need to build an economy that's more just, more sustainable, more regenerative, because the current path we're on doesn't work. Okay, let's change that path. These are all human systems. We can change them, but it doesn't require people up here to change. We can start changing now, here. Climate change, we, we're not going to solve climate change with, I don't care how many agreements we have in Davos or wherever these people meet. No, that's not going to happen. It's when regional economies start to think about how do we build a sustainable food system? How do we build a sustainable energy system? It's when regions come together and start to answer those questions at a regional scale that, that, uh, that we'll start to see measurable improvements. I love and, how you're, you're, con- you're connecting our conversations to communities. And this is one of the big failings, right, of the yeah. last 20, 30 years where so many organizations extracted, right? The, they're looking to maximize profit and um, it's all about Wall Street. And sh- that stuff's important. But when we ship all the jobs to a different location or we're not thinking about the communities in which we sit, then to your point, things start to fall apart. Well, I'm long enough in the tooth to be able to share with you a couple of experiences. Number one was that uh, when I graduated from business school, I said I was gonna go back to work in Washington. And my capital markets professor looked at me on graduation day and asked me, what are you gonna do? And I said, I'm going back to Washington to work. And he looked at me and said, what a waste. (laughs) (laughs) So, and you know, he was the guy, you know, it's all about shareholder value. And I thought, no, I don't think so. I don't think it's all about shareholder value. I think it's uh, different more than that. So that that's one thing. But second was when I started working in General Electric and I was in the teams that were working on how do we globalize our appliance business? How do we globalize our well guess what, folks? We didn't spend we being the group in, in to figure out whether we should shut down uh, an electric motor plant in Owensboro, Kentucky. That was a decision made like that. We didn't think about the community. Come on, why? If we thought about labor costs. Hey, you Cost this much over here, this much over here. This is easy. Boom. Um, and that's about how it was happening. And that's one of the reasons that I stopped doing corporate consulting and went into consulting with communities because what left, what was left behind, I'm from Cleveland, okay? I grew up in a family manufacturing business. Um, I grew up in an entrepreneurial business, right? Uh, with a tradition of on my great my grandfather's grandfather started a soap business in Cincinnati. Okay. So we grew up in this, Hey, it's all about entrepreneurship. It's all about building value. It's all about not taking things away, but what is your obligation as a person at the top of there's not, there's, there's no mystery to me that the only corporation that's been in the Dow since it started is Procter and Gamble. Procter and Gamble. Why is that? Because that company is run with a deep sense of values, deep sense of responsible values, in my opinion. And that's that's what I grew up with. That's how we. And so this whole idea about it's all about maximizing profits. And no, no, it's not. (laughs) It's not about max. It's about what your social obligation are, what your what your community obligations are. And again, this is the form of capitalism that was swept away 
with uh, in the 19, starting in the 1970s, early 1980s, when everybody said it's all about markets, free markets, baloney. There's no such thing as a free market. Markets are creations of the state. Corporations are creations of the state. They're creations of us. They're not creations of anybody else. And so to run these things just for a benefit of a handful of people is completely nuts. It's just nuts. And so don't do it. Let's do something else. And so I believe very strongly that in the capitalist system, I believe very strongly in the market system, but I also believe very strongly in the civic economy, in what we can come together to do together. And so I like working with companies that understand that obligation, that, that it's not all about, um, you know, it matters how you treat people. It matters how you move forward. I mean, you know, and unfortunately, we, we've lived through 30 years of, I was on Capitol Hill when we understood, I was uh, working for the Senate and Democrats in the policy area, my competitiveness, trade, tax policy, that was my portfolio. And this is when we said, all we supply side economics, all we need to do is cut taxes and everything will be great. Everybody, well, we knew that that's, that's crazy. That's not gonna work. The taxes we pay go to the investment in the civic economy. It goes to the investment in our schools. It goes to the investment in our roads. And, and if you don't believe that, let me take, take your business to South Sudan. Let me move your business to Southern Sudan because there is no civic economy there, folks. There's no police, there's no nothing. Run your business. Or in the 90s, I was in China, right? I've gotten a, the China, Chinese economy is fundamentally corrupt. Unfortunately, that's true. And I ran a business, joint venture business that was overwhelmed by corruption. Well, it's frightening not to have reliable police around. It's frightening not to be able to stop the gangs that come into your plant and try to destroy it. That's a frightening experience. Well, that's why I, I think we need to pay taxes so we don't have that. So I'm getting off on things, but you, know, <laughs> you, t- you touched on some things that I feel passionate about. Well, and, yeah, and, we and I think it's, we can do better. It's, it's also, I mean, I think a, a lot of times, and particularly for the last 20 years, we've been talking about civic engagement like it's a nice idea. But you look at the portfolio of companies that Conscious Capitalism in Raj Sodia's book, uh, books have, have detailed, that the companies that actually take a multi-stakeholder pr- approach are not just slightly more profitable, but ridiculously more profitable. Yeah, they would outperformed the S&P by... Like 1600 percent and and if and then you will look at the amount of waste in our corporations and that's 70 percent failure rate of major corporations uh, banks are going to spend 300 billion dollars this year on digital transformations and they know full well that 70 percent of that money is going to be flushed down the toilet yet they are continuing to do it anyway and it doesn't need to be that way with a more collaborative approach amazon lost a billion dollars out of seven billion dollars in profit from from attrition, from from just not taking care of their people well. I mean, well, so think, think about yeah. Starbucks. I mean, you know, just think for a moment about Starbucks. Okay, Starbucks was created with this great idea: we're going to be the nice third place in the community. Blah blah blah. Well, you know, the administrative law judge just came out and and slammed the corporation for exploiting its workers. And you know, it's like, what the heck? I mean, how do these two things together go together? They don't. I mean, how can you be the center of a community when you treat your workers that way. I mean, it's just, it's like, where are you thinking? I mean, you're not <laughs> thinking. It's like, now, it doesn't work. When, we, when we talk about um, using strategic doing in organizations, um, you know, another thing that really I found compelling about the discipline and about um, conversations and turning those conversations it, to action is, how it engages it engages everyone right to mm-hmm. to work together right. uh, and you can start very small you can start in a department with just the two or three people um, let's talk a little bit about that um, mm-hmm. and how um, you know even a small organization or how a very large organization might use strategic doing um, you know well let me go back to yeah so let me go back to this equipment reliability question of course you didn't have top cover in this big 
saying, hey, we're going to follow strategic doing. But you had some middle managers who said, you know, we got this equipment reliability problem and, and, and we don't know how to solve it. There's no manual that's going to solve this problem. And we don't, we don't have a lot of assets. Um, so what they did was they created small teams, not only within the organization, but outside the organization, because some of the legacy equipment, you know, needed suppliers who could, could make custom parts, you know. Uh, and so you can take a complex problem and start building your own network around this. And again, you don't have to tell people you're doing strategic doing. Just learn the skills about how to design and guide a conversation. You know, four questions to start, or maybe two questions to start, four questions in a conversation. The two questions being, where are we going? What's, what's, what's the future look like that we're trying to head toward? That's number one. Number two is, what are we gonna do next? What, what are we doing next? That's the, you know, those are the two questions. The answer to those two questions, just follow the four questions that are set out in the book. To get really good at it, practice the skills. Practice the skills of designing and guiding a conversation while you're having the conversation. Being able to go from the balcony to the dance floor, back to the balcony to the dance floor. It requires some mental agility to do that. Just practice, you practice it and uh, do that. So I think, you know, that's, that's the beauty of taking it down to the individual level and to the individual skills is that you can practice wherever. We have people who practice strategic doing, designing birthday parties, going to their faith community and, you know, well, what could we do? What could we do? Or, you know, just taking as we did with, uh, with Lockheed, take, take, a, take an issue that was complex, but, you know, nobody was solving it. Okay, um, let's try that one. So there are a lot of different ways to practice. The most important individual lesson is understand that conversations in a knowledge economy are the key core technology. That's how you generate and distribute knowledge in your organization. That's how you create the experience that people go, wow, that was great, I really enjoyed it. Or you create the experience with, that guy's a jerk, I'm never gonna meet with him again, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, you, you, it's totally in the power, your power of how you design and guide the conversation. We just had a fascinating conversation this morning with a practitioner in NASA, in NASA. A lot of the bad behavior that we see in our organizations is just learned behavior, it's learned behavior. And so how do we unlearn that behavior? Well, we need to behave our way, and this is the premise of strategic doing, we can behave our way into new ways of thinking. We can do little steps together, little steps together that build this pattern of aligning our words with our deeds and creating trust. That's how trust emerges. That's it, we know this, but we don't, for some reason, we check our common sense at the door as soon as we walk into work. <laughs> um, we're almost out of time. So um, I'll now, Ed, I, I'm going to, I'm going to pose this question. I'm going to put this question up, but we're almost out of time. This is okay. from Greg Sattel. Oh, Ed, what effect do you think lacks antitrust enforcement has had on competitiveness? competitiveness over the last two decades? That's a really good one. You know, I was an, a former antitrust attorney at the Federal Trade Commission. So that's a, one that's near and dear to my heart, Greg. Um, I think lax antitrust inform, enforcement has had a devastating impact uh, because if you just look at the stifling of competition, there's a variety of different things See, through acquisitions, Facebook's acquisition of all of the different platforms that it acquired at once, or alternatively, um, the, uh, the anti-competitive effects, which people are addressing now, of non-compete agreements. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of, when you start to think that, that the civic economy doesn't matter, that, you know, antitrust doesn't matter, that all, you know, environmental regulation doesn't matter, you get um, market-driven solutions that are inequitable, and um, non uh, and 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 below the performance opportunity that we have, we we don't innovate as much, right? And so um, I think lax antitrust enforcement is one of the big um, problems mm. that we have had. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I I'm I'm with you on that. It, the EU is ahead of us on this, and yeah. um, you know, and it's only because this 
neoclassical economics. Neil has, has taken over, and, and we need to think about our civic economy and what what's we got to think about Eleanor Ostrom's questions about the common good and how do we how do we create the common good? Just remember how Oklahoma City is thriving, right? That right. there is a better way. That that you know, for all the good that our economy is, it could be so much better. Oh, it could yeah. really be so much better. Um, and as we move from this industrial age economy to this digital age economy, as we move from one S curve to the next X S curve, number one, we have to change how we're thinking, we have to change how we're behaving, and what we have to change how we're doing. Um, and in doing that, in, in making that move, we have a tremendous opportunity for a shared prosperity um, that it's ours. It's ours for the taking. I mean, we can do it. Um, and, you know, I'm all about it. <laughs> Anybody else who's all about it, you know, people, you know, people rising. Um, yeah, Ed, that's it. Where can they find you? I, you've got a good friend out there who is uh, posting, you know, here's the book. <laughs> okay. Yeah, right. there's the book. You, um, you can get you on can Amazon. To, here yeah, is uh, whoops. Here is the um, the website where you can certainly find more about ah, strategic doing. Yeah. yeah. And of course, you can um, continue to follow us as we talk about. Uh, you know, let next week we have an economist that's going to be on that can answer questions about the labor market. And we continue our journey to uh, help organizations transform. I mean, that's that's what this group is about. Uh, mm -hmm. We want to see people thriving. And um, I just am so thankful that uh, Ed came today, that all you guys came back, that everybody who's watching came back. Uh, and, um, you know, we are two minutes over. So um, I'll sum it up there. Thank you so much, Ed. For coming. Thank you, Thank you everyone, uh, for your questions. Um, Greg, Scott, I mean, so many people. Uh, Tara, I mean, Sam, uh, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Carla, thank you all so much. See you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, all.